Today our presenters are David Brand, Jason Maslin, and Ari Saget. This team of Prativity Consulting Professionals hails from our Chicago office. Dave is a Managing Director and he leads our global IT audit practice. Dave's presented audit committee reporting best practices at many conferences, including, since it was so popular, the IIA All-Star Conference last year. So we are very pleased to have Dave and this team doing this presentation for the first time as a webcast. Thank you so much, Dave, for joining us today. And I'm turning it now over to you. All right, thank you very much, Ashley. So on your screens, you see the, the table of contents of what we're gonna cover today. Um, the presentation's really laid out in, in, I would say, two quick formats. One is uh, there's an educational piece up front that we'll talk about, which is, you know, what are some common things to expect in an audit committee? How do we get the expectations understood of the audit committee? Um, what should we be covering as we go through it? Uh, and then we'll get to the rest of the presentation, which to me is, is the most valuable piece for you guys, and that is all the examples. Um, the presentation is available. You'll see an attachment button on your screens. Uh, you're able to download this. So if we don't cover every slide, that's okay. We'll talk about some of the highlights. We may skip a few slides here and there. Uh, the important thing is that you have these and, and they're at your disposal to use going forward. The first thing I'll cover is key factors in determining content. Um, every company is different. I don't want to pretend that, that everybody you know, should do it exactly the same way. But it's incumbent on each of you to understand what is it that your company wants. Um, we've seen audit committees that want to see every report and every word you write, and audit committees that don't want to see anything other than what you feel is most important. Um, audit committees that meet, uh, the most I've seen is, is 16, 18 times a year, some that meet, you know, four. Um, it, you have to figure out from them, and the important thing is to talk to them, especially if you haven't had that discussion in a while. So. Um, it, it's very common when we come in to do quality assurance reviews or strategy reviews around internal audit uh, that we hear from the board that the reporting's a little bit stale, that they'd like to see changes. I mean, it's always interesting because if you talk to the, the CAEs and the audit teams, they would say, you know, it's been the same way for 10 years and they really like that and they're comfortable with it. So, you know, all I would say is um, make sure you talk to them and understand what is it they expect, how would they like to see things differently. Yeah, and I think it's good to always push and, and try new different things that might be interesting to them. Um, all within the context of your charter, right, the internal audit department charter, that's going to govern what we as a function go out and look at, and the audit committee charter, which governs what they're responsible for. Um, so keep those things in mind. And then the frequency of the meetings, certainly if you have meetings that are, that are more frequent, you can break it up into smaller chunks and report things maybe in more detail. If you have less frequent meetings and you have more to cover, um, you know, you might do things at more of a summary level. So I understand all of that plays a part in how we determine this. The typical audit committee agenda, um, you might have some slight differences, but this is pretty universal. Call to order, review of the minutes, uh, internal, external audit. You might have legal, hotline, compliance. Um, you could have executive sessions. You might have formal presentations by uh, CFO, controller to cover any of the 10K, 10Q, um, date and time of next meeting, and adjournment. Uh, I did want to hit, and you'll see it at the bottom of the slide, one of the most important things is that executive session. Uh, we see a mix at different companies. Some people do it regularly. Some do it as needed. Um, unfortunately, some don't do it at all. Uh, I would certainly recommend that you get in a practice of having them, even if you have nothing to say, just so that if you ever really need it, it's part of the common practice, and it doesn't raise any red flags as to why you might be asking for it. Um, but we do see that as an important piece of the, the agenda. Uh, you'll notice some red bubbles on the right there. Those actually are the standard numbers. Um, so we tried to go through and say on a typical quarterly report, right, so if you're one that's doing, say, monthly reports to the audit committee, you know, you can break this out a little bit differently. But, but these are typically things that are reported more frequently throughout the year. Um, and a lot of these are examples that we'll cover, but dashboard on current activities, so telling the committee what we're doing, why we're doing it, what are the things coming up, what did we just complete, I mean, you'll see those linked to standards 1111 and 2060. Changes to the audit plan, if there are any. Um, many of you may be doing quarterly plans, so every quarter you're going and updating them. Uh, status of the plan, how far are we on achieving it, um, and are we going to achieve everything we need to. Critical findings or emerging trends, um, things that you want to highlight for them. 
I will say, you know, more and more we see boards talking about, uh, I want internal audit to evaluate the information and bring to my attention what they think I ought to be looking at versus providing me everything and letting me sift through it. Right? So I think it's really important to think about not only the critical things that we found, but, but try and package that in the context of the business and put together some trends and, and try and help the committee think through those. Um, staffing, resource limitations, cost versus budget, these are all things. Uh, results of special investigations, department performance metrics and scorecards, and, and we'll talk about some of these later in the examples that we have. Um, and any, any impairments on independence or objectivity. You'll notice that on the next slide we get to annual content. This actually links to a, a fair number of standards. These are things that, you know, the IA would say that as internal audit function, we need to make sure we're communicating to the committee. Um, and many of these can be done on an annual basis. Uh, and then you'll notice at the bottom there's a few that really are optional. They depend on whether or not your function reports them that way, but we'll talk about those. Uh, so the first one, report on the year in review, right, themes, trends identified. Update the risk assessment um, and the plan. Report on the results of the quality assurance and improvement program. Remember, uh, a quality program is supposed to be periodic, ongoing, and external. Right? It's not just the every five years someone comes in and does one. There's supposed to be ongoing activity. You should be reporting on that. Um, discuss the, the results of the external quality assurance review. So if you had one, what came out of it? Um, Review and approve updates to the department charter. That should be an annual activity, making sure it's still consistent and relevant to the business. Independence of the internal audit activity. Uh, disclosure of any nonconformance with the standards, right? So to be in conformance, you have to disclose when you're not in conformance. Um, and then these last two, this one, um, it's guidance from the IAA and it's not required, meaning you don't have to offer an overall opinion on the control environment, but if you do, there are standards around how to do that, and you should be communicating that. Uh, and then if you run into any examples or times when management chooses to accept risk, that that's something that you're supposed to be communicating to the board. Now, to facilitate all that, we do see companies that put it on a calendar. I, I think this is just an easy way to do it. Um, oftentimes, chief audit executives are responsible for maintaining the calendar for the audit committee of what, what topics are covered when and who's going to be presenting. Um, to me, putting it all on a calendar like this, we just wanted to show you an example. It's, it's a very easy and clean way to do that. You can put it in front of the committee, make sure everyone agrees with which topics are when, and schedule the right people to be there. Um, it also helps you cross-check and make sure that you cover everything you need to cover as you, uh, as you go throughout the annual process. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll turn it back to Ashley real quick, and we'll cover our first few poll questions. Thank you, Dave. So we have three poll questions. We're going to move through them quite quickly. The first poll question says, how often does an internal auditor attend audit committee meetings in your organization? Is it every meeting, every other meeting, as needed, never, or does not apply? Just going to give you a couple seconds to let us know how often as an internal auditor or an internal auditor attends your meeting. Okay? And you should be able to see those results as they come up. After you finish um, voting, and I'm going to stop voting now and move on to the next question. The poll question next is, is there a trend towards internal audit receiving more time on the audit committee agenda in your organization? Yes, no, or don't know does not apply. Okay. It looks like the trend is towards yes, as you can see, a little bit more than no, up to 47% for yes. So let's get on to our third poll question now. Thank you for participating. The third poll question is, do you think the internal audit portion of a typical audit committee meeting is adequate in your organization? Yes, meaning yes, we have adequate time to present to the audit committee. No, no, we really don't, or don't know does not apply. So it looks like uh, the results so far, the majority of you, 71, 72% say yes, the internal audit portion of a typical audit committee meeting is adequate in your organization. 18% say no. 12% say don't know. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for participating in the poll questions. I will now turn it back over to Dave to resume uh, talking about dashboard samples. Thanks, Dave. 
All right, thank you very much, Ashley. So on the dashboards, we have a, a couple different examples I'll talk about. Um, I'm not going to say a whole lot about the first one other than, you know, I'm a big fan of dashboards. I think, you know, any time that we can have a graphical way to present a lot of information to the audit committee that that's easier for them to digest. And, and I think dashboards, you know, as many of you know, we oftentimes get into an audit committee and think we have 30 minutes and find out we really have five minutes. If we've gone through and prepared one page that summarizes everything, that talks about the high points of the deck we want to cover and the things we want to make sure we hit, um, it just gives an easy way to, to then step back, still have a productive five minutes, get through the things you want to get through um, versus then try and scramble through it. So dashboard sample two, uh, there were a few interesting things on here I, I like. So one, the key message points. It's right at the top, tells people, here's what I want you to take away from this deck. Um, summary of completed activities, right? In the second quarter, the third quarter, got the audit scheduled. Uh, we have remediation status. And remember, this covers off. We're supposed to be doing follow-up on all of the, the issues that we've identified. So um, we show the remediation status, where the findings are, the past due findings. You know, it's an information-rich slide that I think gives people a lot of information that they can take away from it. Um, we'll talk a little bit about Dashboard Sample 3. The only difference I like on this, and I'm a big advocate of the value that internal audit provides to companies, and if you look in the top right, um, that direct support to the control environment, it's something that we often don't capture. So you, know, you as internal auditors, you might sit down with people and brief them on uh, say, new regulations. You might brief them on the control environment. You might go out and talk to new hires and do a briefing for, say, the finance organization new hires about what it means to have good control or what appropriate evidence is. But those are all things that you probably don't issue reports on, but you can capture that activity on a dashboard like this and be able to explain to management and the committee some of the value you provide to the organization that's beyond, you know, just what shows up in an audit report. Um, so different things to think about. There's a lot of ways to solve these, but I thought those were a couple of interesting ones that, that you might find. And then, you know, certainly you can look at them at your leisure when you go through the deck. I'll turn it back to Ashley for a couple more poll questions here, and then we'll get to the, the true meat of all the examples we're going to cover. Okay. Thank you, Dave. So we, we have our final two poll questions now. And the first one to start the voting is about dashboards. And the question is, do you use dashboards within your reports to the audit committee? One, yes, always. Two or B, yes, sometimes. C, no. Or D, don't know, does not apply. For those of you that are viewing the results, you'll see that so far it's pretty close. But the primary, uh, the majority of you, 36%, say B, yes, sometimes. You use dashboards within your reports to the audit committee to tie for yes, always, and no at 28%. So thank you for participating in that poll. And we're going to do one final poll question for CPE. And the final question is this. Do you modify each of your audit report presentations based on feedback from the audit committee? Do you modify each of your audit report presentations based on feedback from the audit committee? A, yes, always. B, yes, sometimes. C, no. D, don't know, does not apply. Okay, we're getting most of the votes in now. And uh, the majority of you, or 47%, say yes, sometimes you modify each of your audit report presentations based on the feedback. And 31% say yes, always. And turn it back over to our presenters for internal audit calendar and plan. And that be, that'll be Jason Maslin. Thanks, Jason. Thank you very much, Ashley. This, this first example on the audit calendar is one that, that I like. I feel it's very informative and, and it's very easy to understand. As you can see, it's divided into assurance projects as well as um, consulting projects at the bottom. And then secondly, it also divides it between the business process audits and information technology audits. The other key piece I would point you to on this slide is the risk level legend. It's a nice way to ground the audit committee or the reader into where this particular audit fell in the overall risk map from the annual risk assessment process. 
On the uh, next example, this is more of just a holistic view of your audit calendar for the year, broken down by quarters. Very simple overall, it just shows the, the completed in process and the not started of, of the audits themselves. The third example on the next slide is one around a quarterly update. So it, it briefs the audit committee as to what audits were completed for that quarter, and it also highlights a, a concept around the watch list, which shows what key risks are top of mind to the organization and making sure that, that those are being monitored on a, on a re regular basis. The last uh, calendar example is one that takes your internal audit activities and divides it into specific internal audits and the SOX 404 compliance activities. As you can see in there, the, it shows a variety by quarter of activities, either the audits that are completed or in process, as well as the variety of different things that go on from a SOX perspective. The next section is really around the audit scope and what is the best way to communicate to the audit committee what is the scope of the project that was recently completed. This first example is one that, that overall highlights the processes that were evaluated and, and the specific of supporting procedures that were completed that were in scope. The important piece to this I would focus on is the out of scope area. It's something that it, it helps understand from an audit committee perspective what was in scope as well as what was not assessed as part of this project. The, uh, the next example around an audit scope really just provides an overall view of the key processes and the associated objectives for each of the areas that are being evaluated. Moving on to report summaries. The uh, first example here really focuses on and, and breaks down the findings from, from an audit um, assertion perspective where it shows your first, the first example there, timeliness and accuracy. The second one is, I'm sorry, the completeness and accuracy. The second one is timeliness. It shows them in grouping them, and it also introduces the rating by finding. And it, it's just another way to view the actual audit findings themselves. The second example is one I feel is a little bit more informative because it does provide not only the background of the audit as, as well as a summary of what was reviewed, but then summarizes the observations themselves. Sometimes you can run into an issue of getting everything on one page, but if you have a handful of observations or want to roll them up to what are the root causes, this is a good way to put everything on one slide around the audit. The third audit example, this introduces the concept of rating the overall audit itself, and then also providing some background information, and then having the individual ratings by finding as well, and, and lastly includes that management response at the bottom that, that holistically provides the response on, on the audit itself. This fourth example, this is one where if you're a large audit shop, you're doing a lot of audits on an annual basis, and you start to bucket the types of audits you're doing, whether it's by function, department, or division. This is a nice way to, to represent more of a scorecard perspective of understanding how many audits are getting completed by a given area, and then what is the overall rating for that area. And then it also provides that detail for the individual audits that comprise that overall rating. What was the, what was the underlying summary of, of, and conclusion? One thing is, as you guys watch through this, um, you probably don't know, right? There's, we have 900 folks on the phone. Some of you are from large audit shops where you issue, you know, 150 reports or more a year. Some of you may be in, in audit departments where you issue five reports a year. So as we go through all of this, um, not every slide is relevant to everyone. I think there's something that everyone can take away. Uh, but you'll notice that we have a mix of items that make a whole lot of sense you know, if you're going to only cover a couple reports, and then like this slide we're talking about now, items that make sense if, um, you know, you're someone that's issuing, you know, 100 reports, 200 reports, whatever it is. Um, so, you know, think about the ideas and then think about how these might apply to your individual departments, um, recognizing that, you know, it certainly does cover the gamut. This next slide introduces providing a status update around continuous auditing. So what you will have here is the, the specific activity that was completed, the, the frequency, and some of the key indicators on here is really just to show the issues identified for a given quarter, are they up, are they down, and, and just to help track progress and, and also summarize what are the significant issues from a continuous auditing perspective. The last piece that we're going to focus on for, for my section of the presentation is around issue follow-up status. The first example from a follow-up perspective shows, shows twofold. One is the list of completed reviews and that have completed follow-up, and then also which reviews are in process. And additionally, it, it continues to reinforce what is that overall rating for the report itself. It includes the report date, sometimes the owner. 
If there's any revisions to follow up, you may want to um, indicate that. What is the revised management response? But, but in summary, what we want to provide is just a quick snapshot to the audit committee of, of where we're at from a follow-up perspective. The, the second example, this one is a little bit more, more SOX focused, where it introduces the concepts around tracking around the status of remediation, and then also t the testing status, well, whether if it's internalized coming in to evaluate the finding after management has indicated it, it, it is completed. So this is one where it's, it's broken down by process. It has the design aspect in there as well as operational, includes some comments, and obviously the owners. The, uh, the third status, uh, example, this one gets back to kind of that scorecard where we were talking about the large audit shops. Again, it, it starts to bucket the types of audits by the, by the function, and then you're able to provide, A, that overall rating, but also just a, a quick snapshot of the issue summary and the total issues that, that are to date as well as what's open and really focusing on what's the past due. Sometimes we've seen with audit committees, they really get energized around the past due aspects. So you may want to provide a little bit more detail and highlight around what, why certain issues are past due, what is the revised response and the revised action plan, just to ensure that everything is, is being brought to closure. The last example here from a follow-up perspective buckets the process, but then also starts to summarize all of the audit findings that are related to a given process. So you can see there in the example we have three processes, we have a total of five audit issues that are comprised across those three processes and really just gives a quick snapshot as to what is the target date for remediation and, and who is the owner for those individual um, audit, audit findings. So with that said, I will turn it over to Ari Saget to walk through the risk assessment piece. Thanks, Jason. So hopefully everyone is familiar with the risk assessment process that their organization uses, hopefully on an annual basis at least. Uh, there are so many different ways to describe it, and I want to focus on a couple examples here. The main goal I would suggest is to ensure that we focus on identifying and measuring risk in some type of consistent manner so that we are able to demonstrate clear linkage back to our plan, whatever that plan may end up looking like. The first example here uh, is actually the productivity approach to performing risk assessments. And the way to interpret this diagram is on the left side, we show a bottom-up view where we begin by identifying the audit universe and then risk ranking those audit units. And then if you look at the right side, it's actually a top-down approach where we look at identifying business risks and then prioritizing those risks. The combination of both of those activities drives uh, a really outstanding view of the information and then drives uh, a more robust plan um, when you factor in all those different considerations. The next example, and this is a little bit unique, in that it shows a quarterly view of how a company performs a quarterly risk assessment. So this particular example focuses on a quantitative analysis as well as a qualitative analysis that is then rationalized and socialized with senior leaders and then uh, linked also with different internal audit information with an ultimate goal of creating a focused risk-based quarterly plan to perform audits. And then the third example we have here um, will show us the view for a company that has a risk committee, and so the reason this slide is important is it shows two different things. On the top, it shows the quarterly risk process, and then on the bottom, we start touching on the annual uh, risk oversight process where the company demonstrates to the board annually how it handles risk management and oversight. So now that we've talked a little bit about the different ways of showing how to do risk assessment, I want to talk a little bit about different ways to showcase results. I imagine most of us have seen conventional risk maps or heat maps, um, but you'd be surprised at how many different ways there are to show the, the same type of information graphically. It's most common to see things like uh, significance or impact on one axis or axis and likelihood on the other. Um, we are seeing some progressive departments move, moving more towards additional factors, things like velocity or perhaps even persistence. But in the example on risk map one here, what you have is a pretty conventional view that simply plots out uh, by quadrant the priority of each of the risk areas. The next example uh, takes it a little bit farther and, and groups things into three categories. So we have uh, AP items, AR items, and IT items. And instead of just simply saying by quadrant what are the highest risks, this actually floats the priority based on the relative risk. And so you can see those lines denoting where we have the high grouping, the medium grouping, and the low grouping, which doesn't exactly correlate with the, the, the conventional quadrant ratings. And then we have another example here, um, which is a little bit more IT-focused, but this uses a couple different variables we haven't discussed. 
This shows the risk ranking as well as a historical perspective. So things that may have moved from prior years or things that may be newly introduced this year uh, is a first time item on this map. I would like to point out we see a varying views on how things translate from the risk map to the audit plan. Right? There are a number of companies that would say if it's in the upper right quadrant that that becomes my candidates for audit. There are companies that look at black swans, which are the things that are in the upper left quadrant, right? The things that could be very impactful, but not a big likelihood. Um, and many point to the economic downturn and say there were things that were in that quadrant that maybe we should have considered and didn't. Um, there are also companies that might say, you know, even if it's in the lower left, just from a deterrent, right? Internal audit may pick some of those and go review them. Um, I, I'm a fan of, you know, there's a value of internal audit providing um, assurance, and assurance can be whether it's around a high-risk item or remember when something's in the lower left, it usually indicates that management believes there's an effective control environment. There's nothing wrong with audit verifying that that effective control environment exists, um, and I think that provides some value. Right? It's, it's all about how you want to balance your plan, how much time you have, uh, and, and then again, the expectations of management and which role they want audit to play. Uh, but I did just want to point out it's, you know, we all put together heat maps. Not everyone looks at them the same way or translates those to an audit plan the same way. Thanks, Dave. And then the last example I want to share here um, is not the traditional risk map, but rather uh, this particular company chose to show its entire audit universe and then overlay the actual risk ratings on top of that. So you can see there's a little bit more detail here. It may be hard to view on your screen, but if you print this out, you can see it a little more clearly. Within each of the categories, we, we drive to a, a new layer of depth, and this combines the two together. I would submit that this is probably a really good way of supplementing a risk map, so it might actually be the two of these combined that paints the full picture for your audit committee. Let's transition uh, to the benchmarking topic. So there's a variety of different benchmarks that may be available. Uh, some of this depends on, for example, your relationship within your industry. You may have access to uh, information about your competitors or about your industry peers. Uh, you may also have access to the Institute of Internal Auditors gain surveys and, and, and corresponding results, which provide really rich content uh, upon which you can benchmark a number of different aspects of your department. The first example we'll show here um, is for a company that actually did have access to uh, an industry peer group. And so what this shows is a comparison of uh, FTEs within the department as uh, along with internal audit spend. And so just the way to interpret this is we, we can see on the top that there's a range uh, and an average, and it shows a high and a low, and then it lays on top of that the actual uh, the actual rankings for this particular company. So how did this company stack up against their peer group? Uh, and the same analysis or the same principles hold true for the spend comparison. The percentages on the bottom uh, are another interesting view which shows internal audit spend as a percentage of revenue. Again, just another metric to use to think about benchmarking, but this was a company that had access to competitor information, and so that may not be practical for you depending on your industry, but if the information is available, I think it can yield some very interesting results. The next example here is something we see most commonly used in departments that are either newly formed or for departments that are experiencing some significant change or transition. And so this is a way of looking at internal audit spend and understanding that there are about eight different levers that can be pushed or pulled to influence how spend uh, is being allocated for the department. And so um, gain is a good way of getting some of this information, but until you truly understand these levers and their dependencies, uh, it can be hard to understand what spend is appropriate for your department. So this is, again, just one way to look at um, comparing yourself against gain or some other similar benchmark around internal audit spend. Finally, here the last benchmarking uh, analysis I want to go through with you. This is for uh, a large department and a very large global company. Um, the reason I caveat that is you'll see some of the numbers are quite large. But this looks at three different areas. So it looks at internal audit budget. It looks at internal audit headcounts. And then finally, it, it assesses the number of audits that are being performed. So uh, there's the company. It compared itself against gain and six other industry competitors. So there's a ton of different data points, and you can see here that it's a, it tells a pretty interesting story when you look at those three different verticals on how this company performs in comparison to both its peer group as well as uh, the gain benchmark uh, gain benchmark results. 
On benchmarking, we get this question all the time from our clients and then prospective clients, uh, whether we're interacting with board members who ask, you know, do we have enough? Are we covering enough? How do I know that we have the right size department? And from a lot of internal audit directors that um, are seeking to understand, you know, the department's been what it has for several years. The company's gone through a number of different changes. How do I know if we're right? Um, the benchmarking activity to me is, is the easiest way to get there. Um, but I will also tell you, you know, it is very unique by company. Um, so I go back to our original discussion of, what does the company want from internal audit? What's in your charter? What's in the audit committee charter? What are the expectations of management? What role does internal audit play in the organization? And then even things like how, how advanced and developed and functioning are the level one and level two controls within the organization, right? Do you have robust compliance functions, GRC functions, ERM functions, or don't you? All of that factors into the conversation, but you know, I would encourage any of you, if you haven't sat back in a while, whether you use this with management or the committee or just do it yourselves internally, um, thinking through some of these things and trying to decide are we right for where we are today, I think is a very valuable exercise. Thanks, Dave. Let's move on uh, to the next topic, which is SOX program overview and results. Uh, for those of you that have SOX oversight responsibilities, I think you'd agree that there's been a pretty tremendous evolution of ways of reporting SOX information to audit committees. And so we'll cover off a couple examples here. The first one here uh, is something that is most commonly used in companies that are either going through year one of SOX or I'd even say the first couple years of SOX. But this outlines a nice calendar of key activities and milestones for that first year. What I like about it is it shows internal audit obligations as well as management. So you can see the different colored bars there. It also has a nice way of showing the, check, the checkpoints with the external auditor, and it overlays the audit committee meeting schedule as well. So this is something that I imagine as you mature your SOX program, you may see less of a need to give this much detail but certainly in the early years, this is a nice way of setting the foundation and then measuring your progress against this foundation uh, throughout the course of the year. The next example is uh, a more results-based depiction. So here, um, in this example, we are at the uh, tail end of interim testing. We can see in the middle of the chart that we've got clear results on how the business process testing has gone. We can see the IT testing on the right-hand side. And um, what I like about this slide is at the top, you've got those green arrows. And so what that tells me is that at, at a quick glance, the, the risk is low, which is denoted by the green color. And then you can see the fact that it's neutral means it's not improving, it's not getting worse, it's simply, it's simply fine. And, and I think that makes sense. And uh, in my experience, the audit committee is very interested in understanding both what are the results and what are the themes. And seeing a slide like this, if I'm on the audit committee, I feel generally comfortable that things are progressing uh, according to plan. The next example here is related to uh, significant deficiency analysis. So um, this shows a number of items that are potential significant deficiencies. And what I really like about the slide is it actually shows two different perspectives. It shows the client management view, which is the, the, the bigger portion on the top of the slide, and then it actually shows the external auditor view on the bottom as well. And so having the actions to complete for all of that gives the audit committee a view to um, what the company is doing, what management is doing to address these issues, and then hopefully by, by year end we can get some clarity or closure on some of these items and perhaps they fall off the list entirely. But it's a good mechanism to track as we, as we continue to evaluate the significance of deficiencies identified throughout the course of, of the year. You know, we do, it, and this comes up a lot, and um, I don't know that anyone's found the magic bullet on it yet, but, you know, oftentimes when we interact with external auditors, their view of deficiencies, because they all do an integrated audit, is um, deficiencies for both SOX purposes and for financial audit purposes. Um, and, and at the end of the day, right, they're all deficiencies, but they, they are different, and finding a way to communicate uh, those differently to the audit committee, I think, is helpful, right? Because one, one relates directly to the, to the SOX opinion, and, and management has to sign off and go through their certifications, and you have to report that. Um, and the other, you know, maybe deficiencies that are fixed by year end but still pop up in an external audit list because they have to get comfort over how those things work throughout the year. Um, I think, you know, we still have some work to do to get creative and figure out, A, how do we coordinate with the external auditors on that, and then, B, 
Um, you know, how do we communicate that so it's clearly understood so that we can box these things appropriately for the reader? So moving on to the next topic, which is uh, audit organization and qualifications. This is something that we actually, we're seeing a trend uh, to, to include this more and more, but not all departments are, are taking this path yet. I think this is a really nice way of highlighting your department's capabilities and, and celebrating the achievements of the group at a more personal level. The first example we have here is a pretty basic org chart which outlines um, key members of the department. It shows uh, a little bit of information about each person in terms of their certifications, their experience. If you wanted to get uh, you know, a little fancy, you could include pictures here uh, of the individuals on the team. I have seen that. Um, some departments are a little shy and may not want to include some of the pictures, but it's certainly an option. And you have the choice also of including additional information such as um, years of experience within the company but perhaps not in audit, or years of experience outside the company and maybe even listing the specific places you've worked, whether it's in the same industry or in public accounting or something like that, just to give the audit committee a little more flavor on who each of the people in the department, uh, who they are and what they've done. The next example, and this is a large department example, so you can see here we've got nearly 200 people in this department, but this outlines a couple key pieces of information. First, it shows how many, how many resources are budgeted. So we can see there's 181 budgeted across the four different levels. Um, the next column is interesting because it shows filled and open. So at a quick glance, the audit committee can see that there are actually three positions open right now within this particular department. You can see that this company has a rotational program, and they, uh, they are heaviest uh, in that rotation at the lowest level, their staff level, but they are also allowing rotation at their leadership and management levels, and so you get a good view into that. And then this particular company does use a co-source provider uh, for some staff augmentation at the lower levels, and it's a good way of just kind of holistically uh, depicting the department's personnel. It also outlines some of the certification requirements as well as training requirements for the group at the bottom of the slide. The final uh, example for qualifications here, again, this is for a global company, and this particularly highlights certifications on the left, uh, and on the right-hand side, language skills. And this is something that I think is going to continue to grow in importance as companies expand into new markets across the world, is knowing where we have internal capabilities to assess uh, operations in different parts of the world that may not have uh, English language skills or, or may have unique skill sets that, that people in the department could possess, and this is a good way of showcasing that to the audit committee. Again, if you're not using this type of information, I would strongly suggest trying to find ways to celebrate the achievements of your team, and this is a quick and easy way to do it. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Dave to talk about reports on quality. All right, thank you, Ari. We are in the, the home stretch here, so um, we'll cover these last few things, and then we have had a number of different questions come in, so um, we will uh, try and cover off on some of those if, uh, if time permits. So the first thing you see here, this is the, the balanced scorecard. So remember I talked about at the beginning, um, just some of the standards require that, that we report on the quality program. Um, this to me is one easy way to do it. Right in this example, um, you can see that the department came up with uh, various criteria that they want to evaluate, so open positions, professional certs, right, whatever it is, and they've chunked it into different buckets from personnel, execution, and then quality, um, and you can see on the far right under quality, they have QAR rating of generally conformed, so uh, that was specifically tied to one of the standards we talked about, about communicating the results of your quality assurance review. Uh, but it's an easy way for, for a department to determine what are the key things that we think uh, make us valuable to management, and then how do we track those and report those over time. The next slide, and, and I actually like this one a little bit better only because, um, you know, it more directly links to the words out of the standard. So here we have external, periodic, and ongoing. Much of the same criteria, just formatted a little bit differently to cover off on those buckets. Um, but the same idea, right? These are things that the department decided were important. They're things that they track. Um, and then things that they grade themselves on periodically and report on. So you can see, you know, envision in your own mind for your department, what are the things that you track? My guess is you already have a number of these things you've identified. You might track them. You know, are we putting them on a page and getting them to the audit committee? You know, and that, that's kind of the important step that needs to be closed off on. Um, reports on coverage, so we do see this come up quite a bit. 
I actually like this. I'm a big fan of, you know, I think it helps us plan an audit program. I think it helps us put together our annual plan. And where we've used this, I think it's very helpful for the committee because oftentimes, you know, they get a, so many documents and reports and information, it's, it's difficult to put it in context over time. Um, so you can see what this actually does is it shows um, kind of an excerpt from someone's uh, audit universe, right? So this is their process classification schemes, all the various things that make up the company. Um, and then they go through and identify where did we do some level of work on an annual basis. You know, and you can see in some places they do them, you know, almost every year. In other places they might be on, you know, a longer-term rotation, right, depending on the risk and whether or not they deem it effective to go there. Uh, but it's very helpful, and it drives a discussion on both of those areas. Either A, you know, management felt like um, an area was risky enough that it warranted review that many times over a number of years, or you can get into discussions about, well, why haven't we been to certain areas? Um, and that discussion can be very productive because it helps you validate your view of the risk assessment. So a little bit different view, and this is one we did for uh, a company. It's their IT organization. Um, so you might recognize all the COBIT terms, um, right? So we used COBIT as a process classification scheme for IT, and it did something very similar. You know, we, we noted um, – when we've audited those different areas, and then we've added another dimension here. Um, you can see that we've been doing this for a number of years. The, the coloring denotes how that area was rated the last time it was audited. Right? So it just gives another view of management to go back and look. Um, you know, and you can question things. If something is, is red and we audited it three years ago and had a, a higher critical finding or report rating, um, you know, it might drive some conversation around why we haven't been back there over the intervening time period. Assurance mapping, and this is um, kind of the last thing I wanted to talk about. Uh, so there is a standard, right, and it says that the, the chief audit executive uh, must coordinate with other risk management functions. I'm paraphrasing on the language there. Um, and then in the, in the supplemental guidance that was provided, uh, this concept of assurance mapping came up. Um, we see a number of departments that are in process of Starting to go through this, I'll be honest, we have not seen a whole lot of departments that have solved this yet. It can be a fairly involved activity, but if you're not familiar with it, right, all assurance mapping says is at the highest level, um, what are the key risks to the organization? Right, so let's, let's lay those out, and, and hopefully those somehow align to ERM, even if they're, say, a level down from ERM, they're, they're linked back up. Um, and then for each of those risks, how does the organization know that we're covered, right? So it lays out, and I like this one because it does the, the three levels of defense, right, level one, two, and three, and there was a, an IA publication that came out recently on that. Um, it's a 10-page document. It's an easy read if you haven't read it. Uh, but it describes kind of this three layers of defense concept. Um, so this org is organized by that and allows you to say, well, for level one, you know, what is management doing? What are the control owners that are out in the field what are they doing every day to make sure that this risk is mitigated? And you have layer two. What is the supervisory function, the compliance function, the, the oversight that takes place? You know, it could be um, the monitoring function. Whatever it is, what is that next layer? What are they doing, and how do they make sure that this risk uh, doesn't, doesn't harm us? And then the level three um, really gets into internal audit, and then especially in your financial areas, you could even have external audit. Uh, the value of doing something like this is, is somewhat self-evident. Um, we've had a number of companies that, that are going down this path, and it's quickly identified that either, A, we identify risks where we have very robust level one, two, and three activities, uh, and sometimes that's warranted. Right? You can even show the risk, which we do here in example three at the bottom. Um, sometimes that's warranted. Right? It's a high-risk area. We think it's very volatile. It's susceptible to problems. Maybe it's easily defrauded. Whatever it is, it, it needs the attention it gets. Uh, but you oftentimes find that, um, boy, we have an awful lot going on to mitigate a risk in an area that we're not really sure is that high risk. Right? So it gives you a chance to maybe rebalance some of that because on the flip side, we oftentimes find that uh, people will identify areas where it's tough to, to come up with any level two or three activities. Right? And the level one activities we identified might be things that, that we don't test very often. 
Um, and then when you layer risk on and say, well, is that a, a medium or a high-risk area, um, you can get some really good discussion around are we focused in the right areas. So uh, if you haven't done it, I would just encourage anyone to, to go through and look at that. So that's everything we wanted to cover. I know we went fast, and I'll reiterate, guys, the, the presentation is available for everyone um, to download. You know, we, we want to be a knowledge-sharing organization. Uh, as Ashley pointed out at the beginning, this is part of Knowledge Leader. Um, so we're, we're more than happy for you guys to, to take this information, to internalize it, to make it your own. Um, you know, and hopefully there was something in here, whether it's, you know, all 60 or 70 slides or, or just a couple, that you think you might benefit from uh, revamping internally. So uh, with that, Ashley, I don't know if we, how we want to handle the questions. We have a few minutes, and I think if you wouldn't mind going to the email, um, Dave, if you have access to it, there are about 12 questions uh, that you could just scan through and answer a few as we go along, or would you like me to read some out? Um, so I can go through them. Okay. So we did, um, we did see some questions on benchmarking. We mentioned GAIN. Uh, the corporate board also puts out a bunch of, or a host of information. A lot of that can be used for benchmarking. Uh, we also see industry groups that do a good job. So uh, MAPI comes to mind uh, for the manufacturing industry. Members of that uh, periodically will do benchmarking with each other. Um, and then, you know, your service providers, right? Oftentimes they can do um, I'll call it informal benchmarking. Um, we've had companies that have come to us and said, here are my, you know, five or ten companies that I consider to be peers or want to benchmark with them. Can you find out information? And, and we'll, we'll go call people and, and conduct a very specific benchmark just for them. Um, so there's a lot of ways to do that. You know, I would certainly go down all of the paths. Um, and then, as I said before, take it with a grain of salt, right? We don't always understand the scope of everyone else's function. So it's easy. I'll give you a retail example. You might have one retail company where loss prevention is part of internal audit, and they run the SOX program out of internal audit. And if you benchmark them against a company that has loss prevention reporting somewhere else in the management and the controller function does the SOX testing, you get two very, very different benchmarks. And unless you understand that, you can draw some pretty bad conclusions. So, you know, I think you always treat benchmark as, you know, it's, it's directionally maybe accurate, but then you have to internalize it through all those questions that we talked about. Um, so the, we had a question come in around how have you seen or what have you seen for demonstrating linkage to business and strategic objectives in risk maps? Um, the easiest thing we've seen is uh, where companies have defined strategic or business objectives, um, I will caveat that by saying we find a lot of companies that don't. Um, so it's oftentimes an interesting start to a risk assessment when you ask for those and, and then have to facilitate sessions to help them come up with them. Uh, but if they have them, uh, we actually list them right in our, our kind of risk list that we go on and organize risks under those, right, because at the heart of it, what we're talking about here is what's going to prevent the company from achieving whatever those objectives are. Um, so we actually like to show it as an inline process from objective to risk and then prioritizing those risks, linking them down to the, the uh, auditable units, um, and then using those to drive an audit plan. Just running down additional questions that came in place here. So we did have some questions about the, the objectivity and independence. Um, it, the standards are, are pretty clear around uh, that we have to report it. I think it's a discussion internally around what specifically is it for you that that would require that. Um, some companies are more conservative than others. I, I think as long as, A, that we've defined, you know, there are certain things that, that have to be, meaning, you know, we can't audit areas that we just worked in, you know, within some reasonable time frame. Uh, we probably shouldn't have people transitioning into areas that they then lead audits in. So, you know, those types of things are pretty clear. Other types of things may not be. Um, but I think the important thing is that, so those of you that are on the phone that, that might be, you know, seniors or managers, that, that A, that you understand how that's internalized at your organizations and that if you feel there's any impairments that have taken place that you're having that dialogue with your CAE. And, and then as CAEs, you know, really understanding is that something that could or would have 
changed our judgment, impacted our judgment, um, you know, and if that's the case, then we need to make sure that that's raised and discussed. There are some questions in here about how the information uh, that we've used in the slides was pulled together, what tools were used, and things like that. Um, everything that's in the presentations here was built in PowerPoint. So these are all uh, theoretically editable items that don't require any special software. Um, for those of you that, are, that may not be PowerPoint wizards, um, the help function is amazingly helpful. Uh, and there may be uh, online uh, resources available as well, but we've not used any special or proprietary tools in the development of any of these materials. Especially in the newer versions of PowerPoint, there are a lot of wizards and ways to help with the formatting and structure and alignment and graphics. That it, it, It's amazing what, what the, the 2007 version or even the 2005 and 6 versions have for PowerPoint. So I definitely would recommend looking into that as you go through and develop the slides. And you would be surprised. Uh, all of these are things either we've seen at companies or we have used ourselves um, in, you know, places where we do the audit committee reporting. It looks like a lot of activity. Uh, you know, once you get the, the template set up and now you're just populating the information each time, it's, it's not as hard as it looks. Um, but there is a lot that goes into it. So, if, you know, if you're trying to do it internally, if you want it revamped, you know, we'd be happy to help. We'd be more than happy to look at what you have to work with you to, to revamp it into a format you like. Uh, and I, I don't think, and I won't claim that, that PowerPoint's the magic bullet, right? This is what we use because we think it's, it's an easy format to communicate the information. Um, I'm sure there are people using Word. I've actually seen uh, departments that use Excel, and they're very good at it, and you would never know when you look at the end document. Um, but it is, you know, it's however it works for your company uh, that goes through that. Um, so the, we did have a question and a couple questions on the three layers of defense. I, we'll, we'll have to send out an email. I actually believe it was called the three layers of defense, um, the IA document that I referenced, but I'll, I'll verify that and uh, we'll get that out. Um, the difference between uh, the assurance that was on there, the, the different layers, right? So we showed um, layer one, two, and three, or level one, two, and three, Right, level one typically being the, the people that execute the control, uh, and we call that primary assurance, meaning that, that that is where the organization really should be hanging its hat. In other words, if you're the person performing a reconciliation, uh, the fact that you're performing that, that you're trained, that you know how to do that, that you sign off that you did it, that you worked out all of the non-reconciled items, that you right, retain the evidence, that that really is the primary way that the company has chosen to mitigate that risk. Secondary assurance, then, is all of the people that look over your shoulder making sure that you actually did it appropriately. We've gotten, so, we've gotten a couple other questions in here also about uh, how to determine what level of information or, or what type of information to include in the materials. I would say if you're a, for example, responsible for SOX and only SOX, uh, it, it may be best to only report on the things that are within your area of expertise and responsibility. You may seek to collaborate with others who have similar compliance-like functions or governance functions to develop materials for the audit committee. But I certainly wouldn't suggest um, trying to include information that you can't speak intelligently to in the event that the audit committee does have questions. I, I would, you know, we do get the question sometimes whether it's they have the SOX function report separately. Right? I mean, this was really intended for an internal audit department that's trying to comply with the standards to cover all of the different things they have to report, um, SOX being one of them. If, if I were to sit down and, and say I own the SOX program and I have to give a report periodically to the audit committee, um, you know, there are certainly other things I would report. Um, but you can go back to some of the same concepts, meaning certainly year-on-year -year trends, um, changes in the control environment. Uh, you can go through... Um, a lot of metrics around the time, the effort, uh, preventative versus detective, manual versus automated, right? So there's different ways you can break down the SOX world. And then, quite honestly, I would spend a whole lot of time on the changing uh, face of the regulation and the expectations. Um, as many of you are probably aware, right, our external audit folks get a whole lot of uh, feedback from the PCAOB, and the PCAOB has been uh, very direct around some of the things they expect that are different than what have been expected in previous years. And I would say in general what, what we see from all of our clients and the teams we work with, 
um, is that the expectation of activity is increasing, mm -hmm. right? So staying on top of that as a as a SOX function and reporting that and making sure that management understands, um, I think would be very important. So it looks like we are right at the top of the hour. I apologize if we did not get a chance to answer all of the questions, but I thank everyone for attending and, and hopefully yeah, you took away something from this that you might find a way to internalize in your own department. So thanks again for joining us and we hope you have a wonderful weekend, everyone. Goodbye.